Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play this video and talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and are done wrong. Here we go. I'm Sheriff T.K. Waters. This is a critical incident community briefing by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Our agency has prepared this briefing consistent with this administration's commitment to openness and transparency to the public that we serve. Now, the Chief of Professional Standards will deliver the currently available information pertaining to this critical incident. I'm Chris Brown, the Chief of Professional Standards for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Today we're releasing information regarding an officer-involved shooting that occurred in the parking lot of Baptist Medical Center South at 14,550 Old St. Augustine Road in Jacksonville, Florida on April 18th, 2023. This information will provide you with a better understanding of what happened, as well as what was known to law enforcement prior to the incident. It is important to remember that when investigating an incident like this, detectives must often interview numerous witnesses, review many hours of video footage, and analyze a significant amount of forensic evidence. With these investigations often taking up to a year or more to complete, we are still at the very early stages of this investigation. Our understanding of this incident may change as additional evidence is collected and reviewed. We do not draw any conclusions regarding whether the officers acted appropriately with respect to the law or JSO policy until all of the facts are known and the investigation is completed. A word of caution. The images and information that are about to be presented may be graphic. When a police officer uses force to arrest someone or to defend against an attack, it can be disturbing and difficult to watch. Your discretion is advised. This officer involved shooting resulted in the death of Jeffrey Allen Martin. Martin was 38 years of age at the time of his death. Around 9.30 p.m. on April 18, 2023, a JSO police officer working off duty at Baptist Medical Center South was informed of a suspicious vehicle in the parking lot by hospital security. The officer observed Martin driving a white Chevrolet Impala for more than 10 minutes in continuous loops in the parking lot. Finding Martin's driving behavior suspicious, the officer called for other officers to assist Several patrol officers responded to the parking lot at Baptist Medical Center South. One officer got out of his patrol vehicle and verbally commanded Martin to stop his vehicle. Rather than stop, Martin rolled down the driver's side window and yelled, shoot it, while holding a gun in his hand. Martin drove past the officer and then fired around at the officer's patrol vehicle, shattering a window. That officer reported over the police radio that Martin was armed with a gun. In an attempt to stop Martin, one officer attempted a pit maneuver but was unsuccessful. A pit maneuver is a tactic by which a pursuing vehicle forces a fleeing vehicle to turn abruptly and come to a stop. After the failed pit maneuver, Martin rammed his vehicle into the back of a patrol car. Martin then collided head on with another patrol vehicle, curving and disabling his Impala near a stop sign. With Martin still inside the vehicle, officers blocked Martin's car in place and prevented it from moving any further. The five shooting officers assumed positions around the car. Officers had firearms drawn both on the driver and passenger side of the Impala. They yelled loud verbal commands to Martin, instructing him to get out of the vehicle. Martin remained in the Impala. Then an officer on the passenger side of Martin's car moved toward the rear passenger door. Martin fired around from inside the vehicle. This bullet broke through the back passenger window, striking the officer in the face. Immediately after Martin fired his gun, all five of the surrounding officers shot into the car. Martin died on scene from his gunshot wounds. The first video you will see is a portion of footage captured by the first arriving officer's body-worn camera. This officer commands Martin to stop his vehicle. Driving past this officer, Martin tells him to shoot it and then fires around through the window of the officer's patrol car. I'm going hot. I'm gonna keep you on, but in my pocket. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. It's good. Stop your car! Stop your car! 
Stop your car. Stop your car now. He's got a zero. He's got a zero. He's got a zero. Shots fired. This next video is a portion of footage captured by one of the shooting officer's body-worn camera. The footage shows Martin ran patrol vehicles and refused to stop in the parking lot. After Martin crashes, the officer gets out of his vehicle with his gun drawn. He runs to the driver's side of the crashed Impala and repeatedly yells at Martin to exit the vehicle. When Martin fires around from the vehicle, this officer fires his weapon at the Impala. <laughs> SUV, what kind? The one Chevy four door sedan. Talk to the windows. One that just turned left that you're driving out of. All right, I see it. He's still circling. The speed, the speed's about 25 30. Let's, we're going to pit it, ram it.
Next, you will see a portion of the footage captured by the body-worn camera of the officer who Martin shot. This officer approaches the crashed Impala on the passenger side with his gun drawn. When the officer gets within arm's length of the rear passenger door, Martin fires around from the interior of the Impala. The officer is struck in the face by the bullet and immediately returns fire into the Impala. This officer then calls out to his fellow officers that he has been shot. Finally, you will see a portion of the footage captured by another shooting officer's body-worn camera. This officer also approaches the crashed Impala on the passenger side. When Martin shoots from within the Impala, this officer returns fire. From this officer's vantage point, you will see and hear Martin fire around from inside the Impala and the officer fall to the ground after being hit. Need rescue, need rescue. We are, we are in the throat. throat. Crime scene detectives processed the Impala for evidence and located Martin's 9mm handgun under his leg. Additionally, investigators located four spent casings inside the Impala. When detectives searched the trunk, they discovered an AK-47 with three fully loaded magazines, amounting to 90 live rounds. The next step in this investigation involves an independent investigation and review of the actions of the officers by the state attorney's office. The state attorney's office will decide whether the officer's actions were lawful. After the conclusion of the criminal investigation by the state attorney's office, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office will begin an administrative investigation into the officer's actions to determine if they were within agency policy. This begins with the convening of a Response to Resistance Review Board, in which the officers are compelled to provide testimony about their actions during the incident. This board will then decide whether the officers violated any policy during the incident. The determinations made by the board will be submitted to the sheriff for review and a final decision. As stated earlier, JSO does not draw conclusions about the officer's conduct with regards to the law or our policies until the investigation has been completed. On behalf of Sheriff Waters and the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, thank you for your time and attention. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about in this video. Um, the, the person involved um, doesn't really have much of a criminal record. I th think uh, all he has is traffic related type of stuff um, but I'll be talking about um, how I think this kind of scenario escalated into what it escalated to um, and then I'll of course cover the fighting stuff of it as well um, so this person uh, and they don't, they don't provide a picture of him either, but I did some searching and I found his obituary. Um, let me find a image to rest on here. In the parking lot by hospital. Okay. So, 
let's go to this news article that I've got. Um, so this guy, he's like 30 something years old. Um, and as I said, no major criminal history from that county uh, or showing anything from the Florida um, prison system uh, based off what these news uh, entities have looked for. Um, could he be from somewhere else? Maybe. I, I don't think so. Um, looking at his obituary, um, it seemed like um, some people around there, I guess, knew him. Um, so it sounds like he's grown up around that, maybe not that exact area, but um, is from Florida. So what is it that caused him to do what he did? Uh, there was a article that talked about um, his family and his family talking about um, what he did and said that he was struggling with some mental health issues, but they left it at that. They didn't uh, give any more details about what his mental health issues were. So that could lead up to a lot of interpretation. Uh, he's married. He's got a couple kids. Um, don't know what you know career he's in or anything like that. Um, he starts driving around in circles in this parking lot. He's got a pistol on him. And in the trunk of his car, he has a rifle with only three fully loaded magazines. Um, was this guy planning to do something at the hospital? I, I don't know. Um, it's There's a possibility that he was planning to commit an active killer act there at the hospital um, and that he was driving around and just hadn't worked up the courage to get out and do the thing yet. Um, it's possible that he was there to bait the police into trying to stop him with the intentions of doing things to cause the police to shoot at him. It's possible he was stalking someone there. Someone works there at the hospital. It's plausible that he could have been circling the place, looking for the car, uh, circling, waiting for them to come out. Could have been like shift change time, was waiting on them to come out to, you know, confront them. There's many different possibilities of what was going on. We just don't know exactly what was going on. Um, but I will say that overall this incident could have been stopped a lot sooner but I think that it went on and got to the level that it did due to bad policing policies so when this officer um went to get in his patrol car and make a stop on this guy the dude took off that officer was ordered not to pursue now I've seen some other videos from this agency and they've talked about no pursuit policies so I don't know the details of their pursuit policies but they do seem to have restrictive pursuit policies in place I don't think that is good for the community when agencies or municipalities put these policies in place, they say it's for the betterment of the community. It protects the community. It makes the community safe. In all reality, it makes them a lot less safe because all it does is it emboldens the criminals. It makes them more mentally tough in what they're wanting to do because they know all they got to do is take off and the police aren't going to chase them. With other things in place, um, with agency, especially with the de-escalation stuff. The de-escalation stuff, um, the over-reliance 
on wanting to push and use de-escalation. Um, that is a detriment. That is causing more problems, in my opinion, when you're trying to tie officers' hands behind their back and force them to only try to talk things out, to avoid using force. Sometimes, to, prop to properly de-escalate, you have to use force. Sometimes, some people just can't be talked to. Sometimes, you have to punch them in the face. So, restrictive pursuit policies, these soft approaches on on verbal de-escalation only, or try to exhaust it until you're blue in the face. Um, all the the pushback on police, the the quote unquote war on police started by Obama. All that ties into how people regard the police and how they fear the police. There should be a level of fear with police from everyone. Everybody should fear the police to a certain level. Because without that fear, people don't stay in line. Take, for example, who do you, who would you have more fear of? Who would you be more inclined to listen to because you know that if you didn't, things are going to happen to you? Would you be more inclined to listen to a SWAT team? Or would you be more inclined to listen to a rent -a cop at a mall? A mall cop? Mall security guard? Which one would you be more inclined to listen to and follow orders from? Yeah. You're, you're most likely going to be following orders from that SWAT team. You might disregard that mall cop. Well, all these restrictive policies, all these stupid policies being put into place that are neutering our police are kind of pushing them in the category into the same ballpark as the mall security guards. People are having a lot less respect for officers, a lot less fear and regard for them. And they're kind of putting them in that basket where the security guards are at. It's not an order. It's a suggestion. And if that wasn't a, a big enough problem, the legal system, the courts, when the police do catch someone for doing stupid stuff, and they arrest them, and they cite them, and then they go before the courts, the courts don't hold up their end very well. They give them a slap on the wrist. There's places in this country where the police go arrest someone, take them to jail, and boom, the person's out within a matter of a couple hours. Maybe even being released right after the officer leaves the jail. Once the, the citation's completed and the jail has finished their paperwork, the person's bonding out. And then that person out on bond goes out and does something else. So these things coupled together are making our society less safe. If police, I'm sorry, if people look at our police and think of them as like freaking security guards at them all, that's a problem. That is a huge, huge, huge problem. And you can kind of see a little bit of what I'm talking about with this with large metropolitan areas. Some large metropolitan areas. Um, and how the people regard their metro police versus how they regard their state police. And even the criminals. The criminals know this more because they're obviously being involved with police interactions a whole lot more. A lot of these people know they can get a lot further and a lot more mouthier and a lot more dumber with some city metro cops than they can with a state trooper. A state patrolman. 
because they fear that state police more than they do that city cop. They fear and think that they can act a donkey in front of that city cop and that city cop's not going to do anything. But they fear and think that if they act that way in front of that state trooper, that state trooper's going to beat their fucking ass. <laughs> so this person driving around doing what he's doing. Don't know what he's doing it for. Don't know why. But when it gets to that interaction with that first officer coming up to him and nothing happening, uh, I'm sorry, when that first officer trying to make that stop and he's taken off, that's escalating things. This person's like, eh, I got away with this one. I'll do something else. I'll escalate this thing. This violence that we are seeing towards police in my opinion, is is not anything like it was several, several, several years back before Obama. And I've said this before in other videos, and I'll say it again. Obama has started a war on police. Police officers who've died after Obama and part of Obama's um, presidency, I think, can be linked to Obama. Um, <clears throat> the first interaction with this guy, he attempts to make a traffic stop and then he's allowed to take off and go on. Had he continued to be able to chase this guy, things could have played out a whole lot differently. It's just impossible to say if it would or not because we have no idea how it would have changed or how it would have ended but it could have ended a lot differently had that officer been allowed to pursue the person that they were attempting to stop now the second problem is when the officer gets out on foot and approaches the vehicle I'm going to keep you on but in my pocket Oh, it's all good. It's all good. It's good. Good. I'm going to keep you on, but in my pocket. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. It's good. It's good. Stop your car. Stop your car. Stop your car. Stop your car now. Shoot it. Shoot it. He's got a zero. He's got a zero. He's got a zero. Okay, that right there is a huge problem to me. Stop your car. This guy produced a gun. He pulled his gun out on this officer, and the officer did nothing about it. That's a problem. If you pull a gun on the police, you should be shot. <laughs> That's like that should be the cardinal rule. That should be the, the thing that is known to everyone. You pull a gun on a cop, you get shot. We, th th we should not be seeing people pulling guns on police and the police not doing a damn thing about it. This is malfeasance and dereliction of duty. This officer needs to be disciplined. By not acting, he is putting other officers at risk and he is putting the community members at risk. If this dude is going to pull a gun on a cop of all people, a person who he knows to have a fucking gun who could shoot back if he's going to pull a gun on a cop he'll pull a gun on anyone else. This officer needs to be having something done to him for not acting. He did nothing.
Not a damn thing. And I think that he is responsible for the officer being shot. Now, it's a little bit confusing about who this particular officer is and who was shot. So we see in this recording right here that they have blurred out the body cam serial number. We can tell that he does have a, Stop. a watch on. His left hand. And it looks like maybe a tattoo Stop. right there on his arm, possibly. So, the officer who gets shot... We'll go to it real quick. Get out of the car now! Out of the fucking car! You got something in his head! You got something in his head! Get out of the car now! I've been shot! I've been shot! I've been shot! I've been shot! I'm a shot in the throat. Give me the in the shot. Um. Get out of the car now! Out of the fucking car! It doesn't car. look like this officer has a watch on. Got it's hard to tell. It Got just doesn't it look as if he has one on, and you can't see anything on the forearm that looks like. A tattoo um, and I bring that up because the news article makes it kind of confusing um, it talks about the officer comes out of the hospital to stop the guy and then um, or it talks about the officer being shot and it says the officer came out of the hospital and tried to stop the guy so the way some of the news articles sound it makes it sound like it's the officer who came out of the hospital working the security gig who's the one who got shot um, and there's no, nothing I've seen that gives any clear uh, clarification on that um, so I don't know if this is the same officer who ends up getting shot or not I don't think it is based off um, seeing a, uh, a watch on his left wrist and what looked like a tattoo on his forearm and then the absence of that on the other one um, but like I said this is wrong this officer did not do anything what this officer should have done was this officer should have utilized deadly physical force against this person. This person pulled a gun on him. This officer needs to act to stop this threat. The officer has his gun out. Stop your car. He is Stop your car. Stop your car. Stop. To use deadly force. Stop your car. Stop your car. Stop your car. Stop. You see his gun right here. He's got his gun pointed towards the guy. But he fails to use it. He's got his gun out. You, we can see that he has a weapon-minded light, but it's not turned on. In this instance, that weapon-minded light, I think, should have been activated. If you're going to be pointing your gun at someone, it's nighttime, you need to have that weapon-minded light activated. Stop your car now! Shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. He's got a zero. He's got a zero. He's got a zero. And then boom. He shoots the police car. <laughs> so in that instance, as soon as he saw that gun, he should have immediately started firing. Even if the time it took for him to register what was going on and what he was Stop seeing. Your car now! Because he's saying, stop your car now, right there, and then, boom, he's going on. 
And you see that the officer goes to a two-handed grip really quick. So the minute he started to go to that two-handed grip, even though this guy was slightly forward of him, he should have started sending rounds. The guy is a deadly physical threat. He needs to be stopped. He is a substantial risk to the public. So even if this car kept keeps going, still, this officer under Tennessee versus Gardner would have been justified to start using deadly physical force against this guy, even though the back of the car is completely facing him and he's just driving away. He pulled a gun on a cop. Like I said, you pull a gun on a cop, you're like, what's to stop you from pulling a gun on anyone else? Cops, not all cops, but there are cops out there, I think, who they're afraid to do their job correctly because of this war on police bullcrap that's been going on. Police are afraid that even if they use lawful force, it's a justified shoot, that they're still going to be disciplined in some way. Because we've seen it. We've seen these these horrible prosecutors who who want to take these officers and treat them like a, a game piece in a political game and prosecute them for things that they do not need to be getting prosecuted for because they were legal in what they were doing. And if it's not that happening, then it's the public crucifixion that goes on. The public tarnishing the name of the officer, threatening the officer and their family, people doxing the officers, throwing their where they live at, throwing up their home address, stuff like that. Like I said, when you have goofy policies in place and you have goofy practices in place and you have these goofy things going on that put the officer's hands behind their back, people stop fearing the police and start thinking of them the same way that people think about most security guards. He's got a zero. He's got a zero. You got a zero, all right. Call You're a fucking zero. So I think this officer has a bit of a delay in getting out of his car because of the seatbelt. Front block! Front block! So based off what I was seeing earlier with them driving around, I don't think that they were in an area to be able to going to, to be able to be going that fast enough to warrant the need for a seatbelt. So there are times where I think that a seatbelt is more of a hindrance. If you're on the interstate, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you're doing interstate speeds, you're going to need a seatbelt. You're on residential streets, and it's a lots of turns and turns. I don't think that you're going to be getting up to a speed fast enough to where you're going to need a seatbelt. And when this thing comes to an abrupt stop, that seat belt is going to slow you down in getting out of your vehicle. Front block! Front block! It's a long time to be hanging out in that car. A car is not a place where you want to be in 
during a gunfight. Cars are bullet magnets, and they do not stop bullets very well. In fact, they suck at stopping bullets. The only thing that is good at stopping bullets in a car is the engine block. Everywhere else, the bullets are going to go through pretty damn easily. A little small 22 caliber round will go straight through a car door, no problem whatsoever. 9mm will go through both car doors, no problem whatsoever. That seatbelt kept him stuck in that vehicle for a longer period of time than I think was necessary. Um, so agencies that have these... Um, very restrictive policies about you know seat belts and and they have desk jockeys that uh, you know just sit at the desk all the time and don't don't actually go out and do stuff anymore um, trying to write officers up for not wearing their seat belts during certain things like that that doesn't help that doesn't that's not conducive to anything uh, good um, there are times where a seat belt does not need to be worn and this is one of those instances where I don't think a seat, seat belt needs to be worn we see that he activates his weapon by the light you can see the light when it comes on on the ground now you can somewhat see a little bit inside the vehicle um, but the window tent is pretty dark Weapon-minded lights. Lights have come a long way <laughs> since the uh, since they were invented, um, and even from you know the early two thousands till now, they have come a long way. Um, even from the last couple years, great improvements being made. Um, you could almost say that flashlights are somewhat similar to computers and smart devices. Uh, they are being outdated at a fast pace. That's great that we are improving and that we are making these lights brighter, but the downside to it is these companies when they improve the stuff, they change the the shape and the design of the light, and then that then requires you to get a brand new holster for it. <clears throat> Ideally, you want as much light as you can get coming out of your fighting light as you can. If you could replicate the freaking sun coming out of that light, then replicate the sun. If you point your weapon mounted light at someone's face, it would be nice if sunlight would be coming out of their fucking ears. <laughs> That's how bright it needs to be. Um, obviously, no flashlights are able to do that. Uh, but um, our current lights that we have uh, right now um, are pretty bright. And they are really good with uh, tight beams, really good throw on them. But they're still just not that great to be able to punch through window tint. Um, and with the body camera footage, it being a camera, it's, it's really hard to know for sure what exactly these officers can see in person through their human eye. Um, but they may not have been able to see a whole lot of detail um, 
with the lights that they're using. I know that based off this shape and silhouette, it looks like a streamlight flashlight. Um, streamlight, yeah, they do make some, some decent weapon lights. Uh, is it the most current, latest, greatest weapon light there is? No. Um, but um, is, it, is it still able to work? Yes, it's still able to work. Could the newest Surefire light, the Turbo, could it have worked better than this? I, I don't know. I don't know for sure. I think it would have had some degree of being better. How much, I do not know. Could the Surefire X, I think it's X35, I think it is, could it have performed better? Potentially, yes. How much better? I don't know. And as I said, the problem with changes in lights, the the shape of the, the light itself, or the, the mount, or its body, it changes. So for example, the, you know, uh, Surefire X200. When it came out, good light for what it was but then the x300 came out and blew it out the water um if you had an x200 and you wanted to go to the 300 well not just the cost of the 300 light was a factor now you have to buy a new holster so now the cost of a holster comes into play so it can be very difficult for people to afford new lights when they come out. One thing I do like about the X, uh, Surefire X300 Turbo is it keeps the same body as the X300. It's just the internals are better and you get a more tighter, brighter beam out of it. Uh, if these companies would keep with that model of retaining the same size light that everyone's used to, but having the insides, the guts, way better, that would be great. Then we can see people utilizing the newest, greatest stuff. And be more efficient and effective in the field with it. Be more safe. Now, we can't see very well what this officer is seeing, but I think that this officer put a good Shot grouping forward, in here, forward. made a big enough hole in this window to where he could see through that hole and see that person in there. Because it looks like when he fires, he sends more rounds through the hole that he already made. look at fast fight assess scan top off and uh, take over treat injuries um, and talk um, so he has fought right this the person inside the car fired around it's fight time this officer returns fire goes up he's assessing after he shot he can see that the person through the hole you can see that they're, they're, they're doing something else to warrant being shot again, and he delivers more rounds.
He's scanning during that assessment, not doing a 360 scan, but he's he's assessing his hits on target, and I'm assuming that he, he may be, you know, looking through the hole in the window, trying to see more inside the vehicle. So he's he's most likely scanning while he's up there. He sees the threat's still a threat, fires more rounds, and then he starts to back off. And he's starting to communicate to other officers, hey, come to me on my side. I don't know if there's anyone else back there with him. And it may not have been safe to him to do so in that moment, but he could have performed a magazine exchange or reload. He's fired multiple rounds at this point. I would suspect that he probably doesn't have that many rounds left in his magazine. So if this fight started off again, he would fire at a slide lock and then have to do an emergency reload. The best time to do a reload is under your own terms. So when there's a lull in the fight, no one's shooting back at you, that's a good time to go ahead and do a re do a reload. Get your fresh mag out, bring it up to the gun, eject your partially depleted magazine, and put that new one in. That way, if the fight pops off again, you get to start with the fresh mag versus a partially depleted mag. Always best to do reloads on your terms. It sucks to do a forced reload, an emergency reload, because your gun has fired to slide lock. Sucks to do a reload when you are being shot at. Those are not good times. So I think that he could have done a reload. <clears throat> He's trying to communi communicate to everyone. He's trying to yell out. You hear him trying to get on the radio, but him trying to key up, you hear a tone. So he's not able to get his radio to connect because other people are talking in that instance. Now, I don't think that it's completely necessary for him after he's shot to, to immediately get on the radio and start yelling shots fired. Uh, there's a time and a place to be on the radio talking, and with as many people there as there is, someone else can do the talking. You're this close, you're up front, you're Johnny on the spot, screw that radio. You don't need to be talking on it. Both hands need to be on the gun. Both hands need to be dedicated to that fight. Yes, do communications play a role in a fight? Yes, they do. Traditionally, the the forces that can shoot, move, and communicate the best are the ones who typically will win. And communicate communication plays a, an important factor in that. But in this setting, this context right here, he don't need to be on the radio. The hell with the radio. Um, more people there, someone else can, can start blabbing on the radio about shots being fired. He needs to be committed to that fight. Um... But once he starts to back off and he's starting to communicate to everyone, the threat is obviously uh, down at this point or suspected, highly suspected to be down. Um, trying to communicate, he's trying to key up on the radio, but not able to key up because other people are on it. And you can tell the other people on it because that tone that makes that noise when he keys up. Uh, what are these other people saying on the radio? I don't know. They're probably yelling, shots fired, shots fired, shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Um, but I like where he's at, trying to trying to communicate to everyone else. Hey, on me, get on me, stack up on me. We'll go in uh, and get this guy. Um, we only see from his perspective and the other two officers' perspectives. Um, we don't get to see everyone else involved. But I will say that at this point in the game, everyone knows the suspect has a gun. 
before they come to the stop, everyone knows at this point as they're chasing him around, this ha- this guy has a gun. He he pulled it on a cop. Cop broadcast on the radio. He's got a gun. If you know you're going to a gunfight, bring a rifle. And bring your friends with rifles. Now, I don't know anything about how their vehicles are set up or anything like that. Um, they may have rifle mounts in the cab of the vehicle, and they may not. I, I don't know. Um, but I will say that if you're going to a call that is involving deadly weapons, you need, before you ever get on that scene, you need to stop and get your rifle out. So if your rifle is kept in the trunk or the cargo hold, or even in a rifle mount in the front cab of the vehicle, you get a call, it's involving deadly weapons, deadly physical force, you need to stop, get that rifle out, charge it, activate the sights on it if you need to, and sling that thing around your neck, and then proceed to the call. It doesn't take that long to do that. And you may be saying, if it don't take that long to do it, why not do it when you get there? Because of instances like this. Very sudden, abrupt stop. This officer would not have had time to get that rifle out. Even though it doesn't take that long to do the thing, in this moment, when they come to an abrupt stop, it is too long. Because it takes too many steps, too many seconds, to get that damn thing out and put it in the play. So the best way to ensure that you can have a rifle in play in an instance like this, is before you ever get there, stop, get the rifle out, danger it up, and proceed. Then, if, he, if this officer had done this, if he had that rifle out and around his neck, charged, sights on, and then boom, this call or this incident um, came to an abrupt stop, he would have been able to dismount from his vehicle with a rifle in hand and put that thing into play. Same with the other officers. Unfortunately, um, one of my biggest gripes when it comes to doing videos like this is officers neglecting to get rifles out. And um, there is a an issue, I think, across this nation with officers neglecting to get their, their rifles out. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, a lack of a, a good, I don't want to say a lack of a good fighting mindset, but it, 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 it it's in that ball field of a lack of a good fighting mindset and a lack of a good foundational knowledge of terminal ballistics with gunfights. Um, I don't think there's really good uh, realistic training being done with rifles. Um, and I don't think that uh, in a lot of places um, the the mindset behind why you use rifle over pistol is is being um, fostered very well. Um, you start to see that shift as you go to your specialty units like SWAT teams. Like, they obviously get it, right? But that's because they're having their people go to more advanced training. That advanced training, that level of training, for the most part, especially just rifle alone, needs to be offered to regular patrol people. There's also some places that have bullcrap policies and red tape uh, bureaucracy things in place that prohibit or hinder the officers from getting their rifles out. So, for example, um, some places, if an officer gets their long gun out, they have to write a report on why they did that. They have to, if they get it out, they have to notify a supervisor, hey, I got my rifle out. And they have to write a report justifying why they did that. Um, nobody likes writing reports. 
Um, and so officers, to avoid having to write a report, they just won't get the rifle out. And some administrations, they do that shit on purpose, knowing that nobody wants to write a report, and so they won't get their long guns out. Why do they put those bullshit policies in place? Maybe they got a couple calls from the mayor saying, the mayor got a couple calls from concerned citizens saying, an officer pulled a shotgun out and it scared me. <laughs> That's where agency administrators need to learn to tell the mayor, um, okay, well, the officer felt he needed to get the shotgun out. So be it. That person just needs to stop being a pussy. <laughs> If these people are calling in and complaining to the police, police administrators just need to learn to tell people to shut the fuck up. <laughs> but these administrators will put these policies in place to hinder these officers from doing what they need to do. And unfortunately, there's even some places where when officers go to pull their handgun out of their holster, if they pull their handgun out of their holster, they have to write a report on why they did that. If an officer pulls a taser in some places out of their holster, they have to write a report on why they pulled the taser out of their holster. Not even shoot the damn thing. Not even turn it on. If they just pull their taser out of their holster, they have to write a report on why they did that. And like I said, a lot of agencies will do that to encourage the officers not to be pulling those things out of their holsters. And that is setting a dangerous deadly precedent if you are doing this to officers then they're going to be reluctant to pull it out when they need to be pulling it out it is a bad bad scar bad training scar bad procedural scar it's not something that needs to be going on But anyway, like I said, um, if you know you're going to a gunfight, bring a rifle and bring your friends with rifles. I, I would have liked to have seen if they were able to hop out of the car with rifles. And if he would have had a rifle uh, out, chances are the weapon mounted light that would be on that rifle would have a whole lot more uh, candela power or higher lumen count than this pistol mounted light. And could have been able to pierce that window tent pretty damn well. I mean, the, the, the force to, to shear this damn tire back like that. Like, holy hell. So this car is ruined. This car is ruined. I mean, I, wish, I, I, I bet they're happy that these cars are gone. Because these are older cars. So they're not in manufacture anymore. Um, I'm sure they're like, all right, we get rid of these pieces of crap. <laughs> but still... Um, that's, I mean, that's a hard hit. So the guy, the guy just alone ramming vehicles like that. Could there have been an opportunity to use deadly physical force before he came to a stop? Possibly. As he's driving along down the road, ramming police cars the way he is, there, there may have been an opportunity for someone to start shooting into the vehicle to stop him. Now, we don't see enough footage to be able to see whether or not that could have occurred or not, but it is plausible. And if, that, if it was plausible that that could have been done, then it should have been done. A vehicle is a deadly instrument. It can be turned into a deadly instrument. And if he's out ramming vehicles and you have the opportunity to use force to stop them, then they should have used that force to stop them. Got something in his hand! Got something in his hand! Got a car now! I'm a shot! Get out of here! Come on! 
I'm a shot. 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 So you can see that he has a weapon mounted light activated. It's under his head! But it just doesn't seem to be very bright. I don't know what kind of weapon mounted light he has. Um, but it just doesn't seem to be putting out a whole lot of light. We don't see a whole lot of reflection coming off this door right here. No, the car now! Car. It just seems like a head. normal amount. And so it could either be that it's a weapon mounted light that just doesn't have bright enough light, or it could be that his batteries are low. And the light is capable of being super bright. But because his battery power is low, it's not being super bright. Um, there should be a rotation schedule for batteries in your fighting lights. It's going to vary from you know person to person and how much they're using their weapon mounted light and or their fighting light. Um, when you think about Every time you click that light on, that is like pulling the trigger on your gun. And you can only pull that trigger so many times before that magazine goes empty. So your batteries are like a magazine. Every time you click that light, turn that light on, you're depleting your magazine. <clears throat> So you need to be replacing the batteries before you ever notice your light going dim. It's kind of like what I said earlier about reloading your gun. It's better to reload on your own terms versus when you're forced to. Because when it comes to the light, when you are forced to change your batteries, that means your light's not working anymore or it is super dim. Or it's just not at peak performance. And again, like I said, this is going to depend on person to person because some people are using their lights more than others. <clears throat> but you need to replace those lights before you start to notice, I'm sorry, replace those batteries before you start to notice your lights going dim. That way you don't run yourself into a situation where you've got your light out and then boom, it goes to dim or it already starts off dim. If you're rocking lights that use CR123s, Yes, that can be an expensive thing to rotate those batteries out on a more frequent basis. If you work for an agency or a company that furnishes you batteries, then great. Take that advantage. Burn through some batteries. If you're having to pay for that stuff on your own, buy in bulk. Don't go buy a couple batteries here and there. Buy a whole sleeve of the CR123s. Yeah, it's going to be more expensive, or seem more expensive up, up front. But when you do the breakdown versus all the batteries in that sleeve and you buy a two-pack thing, you're going to see that it's a whole lot cheaper to buy them in a big sleeve than, than a two-pack. Um, and write that off on your taxes. Um, but that is a necessary cost. Because, like I said, you don't want to run into a scenario where you, you, you're you not pumping out as much light as you need to be pumping out. And I don't know if that's the case here or what. Uh, if it's just the way the camera lens is capturing the other light and it's not making this light seem as bright or what. But, but that's something I wanted to talk about. So he gets shot, he immediately returns fire. He starts pumping rounds into that car. I'm a 
shot. Of his shot. It looks like to me he leaves his gun on the ground. I'm a shot. I'm a shot. I'm a shot in the throat. Give me the, in the shot. You rescue. You rescue. You can see that better with the other officers' camera footage. Get out now! Get out! I'm a shot. Get out of here! Come on! Come on! Come on! Get over! Get down! Get down! So you see the weapon mounted light on the ground. Or the the weapon on the ground. Come on, come on. Get over. Get down, get down. Right. And it's still back there. So he's left his gun behind. Buddy, where? 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 Need rescue, need rescue. We got, we got in the throat. Throat. I'm seeing detectives process the impound. I'm a shot. I'm a shot. I'm a shot in the throat. Give me. Get out! I'm a shot in the throat. Get in the shot. I'm a shot. Get out! Get out of here! Come on! Come on! Come on. Get over! Get down! Get down! All right. <clears throat> so this guy's been shot. Um, where at in the throat, don't know for sure, uh, but we know it hasn't, uh, hit him in the, um, trachea or larynx because we don't hear a bunch of gurgling noise and he can actually talk. So, uh, it's, it's in the neck, throatish area somewhere. Where exactly, don't know for sure. Um, this is where talk about medical gear and knowledge. If you don't carry a gun for a living, whether you're an armed professional or if you're just an armed citizen, you need to also carry medical gear. If you carry a gun for a living, then you recognize the fact that you could be involved in a gunfight at some point. Why else are you carrying a gun? And if you recognize that, then you, sh you need to be recognizing the fact that a gunfight means that bullets can come towards you. And you could be shot or your teammate or your family could be shot. And so you have to have medical gear and knowledge. If you're gonna have the, the tools and the knowledge to induce trauma, you should have the tools and the knowledge to reduce trauma. Ambulance response times can be lengthy. Seven minutes, that's a long ass time, long time. If you carry a gun because, as an armed citizen, if you carry a gun because you recognize the fact that it takes too long for a cop to respond, then you should have that same mindset in regards to an ambulance. It takes too long for an ambulance to respond. You need to have medical gear and knowledge. Officers, you don't need to be having the mindset of, well, if something happens, the ambulance will get here. No, you of all people should know that it takes a minute sometimes for an ambulance to get there. You need to have medical gear and knowledge. What they end up doing with this guy, as far as treatment wise, we don't get to see. I think that um, have they provided that footage? I think that would have been really great. Uh, would have been more stuff to talk about, but unfortunately they don't provide anything. Um, I will say, um, based off some videos I've seen in the past, after an officer is shot, there are some places where an officer will jump in the car or jump in a car and another officer drives them to the hospital. That may seem like a great idea, but what you're doing at that point is you are, in essence, providing only 1930s era medical coverage. 
you're providing the same level of care that was given back in the 1930s if all you do is put someone in the back of the car and take off really fast because that's what was done back in the 1930s we didn't have ambulances like we do today back in the 1930s back then at the scene of an accident car crash big thing whatever the funeral director the funeral home would send a hearse out and they would come and pick the bodies up and take off and if someone was still there on the scene alive the hearse would come out they put them in the back of the hearse and the hearse would drive to the hospital but nobody would be in the back with them then it evolved and then there you know there would be an attendant in the back someone to kind of you know do some stuff for that person who was all jacked up but there wasn't a very great level of training with that person If you're going to put a some put a person in the back of the car, someone else needs to be back there with them providing some level of care. You don't need to be throwing someone in the back of the car and taking off really fast. All you're doing is providing 1930s era medical coverage. When it does come to providing medical care, uh, TCCC is the preferred um, medical knowledge when treating battlefield type of injuries. Now, when I say battlefield type of injuries, um, that means for this context of um, domestic law enforcement and domestic security, uh, that's small arms only. Um, the data sets that's used to drive the tactics and TCCC do include things like landmines and hand grenades and rockets and stuff like that. Um, although those are not really prevalent here in the U.S., um, there's still some threat of explosions and stuff like that that we've seen here in the U.S., but those other things are just not very prevalent. Here in the U.S., it's just small arms fire. Uh, but small arms fire um, can still lead to the leading cause of death on a battlefield which is massive hemorrhaging um, so when you look at your traditional EMS uh, the way you treat people what you see is ABC's airway breathing and circulation with TCCC uh, you follow March and the very first letter is M for massive hemorrhaging and you address that first um, this is um, a methodology that has been uh, validated uh, through several years of warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan and it is proven to work it saves lives so um, and I say that because most agencies most companies only provide a level of training to CPR 80 first aid um, they either go through uh, uh, American Heart Association or American Red Cross and they do the do the weekend class, you know, the two, three day class that does CPR, AED, and first aid. Well, the bread and butter of those institutions is their CPR, AED classes. And when it comes to that, I think that's all that needs to be is just CPR, AED. Because once you start doing CPR, AED, and throwing in the first aid into it, and trying to do it in a very short amount of time, the first aid stuff is going to take a hit with the thoroughness of instruction. It's going to take a hit with the effectiveness of the instruction. You're not going to have a whole lot of time to be able to go through that stuff very thoroughly um, and have the students do practical hands-on with it. So CPR, AED needs to be its own thing and then a TCCC level of training needs to be the next thing uh, after that. Uh, the first aid material that comes with the CPR 80 classes is very watered down. It's still good information to have, but it's just not very realistic with attending to injuries from gunfights. Um, the class doesn't really go over how to use tourniquets, how to use chest seals, nasopharyngeal airways, stuff like that. It just goes over, 
you know, environmental emergencies like someone having heat exposure or uh, hypothermia, uh, someone having anaphylactic shock because they got stung by a bee, someone having difficulty breathing and how to assist them in taking their inhaler. Yeah, that's good information to have, but it doesn't help you treat injuries for a person who has multiple gunshot wounds. Um, and the, the equipment is a lot different than a first aid kit. Um, unfortunately, many agencies, many companies out there will only provide a bare minimum standard of what's required of them. Um, especially these agencies that, you know, they love to say they're accredited. We're an accredited agency. Blah, 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 blah. That's, that means shit to me. I don't, I don't, I don't give a fuck if you're accredited or not. Um, but these agencies that are accredited, the accreditation process will stipulate that you got to have, you know, first aid kits in all the cars and at the station, you know, there's got to be like so many first aid kits there. Well, these agencies will go out and they'll, they'll buy a bunch of first aid kits and they'll stick them in stuff just to meet that checkbox requirement. Um, but they won't go out and buy a bunch of cat tourniquets. They won't go out and buy a bunch of chest seals and stuff like that because it's more expensive than a standard first aid kit and it's not something that is required of them to have. Well, you can't take a standard first aid kit that has band-aids in it and take band-aids and cover up a gunshot wound on someone's chest and it, it do anything good. It's just not going to work that way. Um, so you've got to have the right equipment as well. And unfortunately, that right equipment costs a lot of money. So a lot of agencies and companies just can't, can't afford it. And individuals themselves, it's not easy for them to afford it as well. Um, there are a multitude of different vendors out there that have these different kits. Um, but I would implore you, if you don't have anything, nothing's issued to you, to get you a kit. Even if you don't have any good TCCC knowledge right now, I still think it's best that you can go get a kit. Um, just because you don't know how to use it doesn't mean that no one else knows how to use it. Uh, you very well could run into a scenario where you don't know jack shit about how to provide medical care, but you got this trauma kit. And you pull this trauma kit out, and then boom, someone on scene may know how to use that stuff that's in it. <clears throat> so yeah, get out, get some medical knowledge and training that's better than CPR 80 first aid. So, looks like he's still in his car seat here. Um, I don't know if he did some walling around as he was getting shot, uh, but somehow the gun ended up under him. Um, and located Martin's 9mm handgun under his leg. Additionally, investigators located four spent casings inside the Impala. When detectives searched the trunk, they discovered... So, this bad boy... Um, why did he have it in his trunk? Why didn't he have it in the cab of his vehicle? I don't know, but it's a good thing he didn't have it, um, or else that officer who got shot, um, may not have survived this encounter. Um, rifle cartridges are way more devastating than pistol. Um, the terminal ballistics are just night and day. Uh, this dude could have done some damage with this rifle. He only had three. He only had three magazines, but he could have laid down a lot of hate and discontent with just three mags, and could have been a real problem to deal with. Um, it's. <laughs> I want to say it's it's a little bit refreshing to see that it's not an AR-15, uh, but nonetheless, the anti-gun crowd doesn't see a difference in this, um, and they will still, you know, call an assault weapon. Um, some will probably even call it an AR-15, just like the dummies who uh, call, you know, other handguns Glocks when they're not Glocks. We do see an absence of certain things on here that indicate that, obviously, the, the criminal was not very well trained or very, very well knowledgeable on things. There's no sling on it. There's no weapon-mounted light on it. Um... Those are clear signs that uh, you're dealing with an amateur right there. Um, 
and going back to what I talked about earlier, what was he doing to begin with? Was he casing the place, um, thinking about doing an active killer event? Um, if so, then um, that's typical with these active killers is they don't have any training. They don't have any good foundational knowledge when it comes to fighting weapons. Um, someone sporting a rifle that has no sling on it, no light on it, that's a sign that person doesn't know anything about what they're doing. We see a mixture of uh, ammunition in these magazines. Um, they're they're still cased, but one has the uh, is the lacquer st uh, still cased. Um, not uncommon when it comes to AK variants, because uh, the AK will obviously eat anything, um, and still cased is the cheapest thing to put through it. And these are the kind of the two variants of still case that you'll you'll find out there for these rifles. But again, um, he's just got very cheap ammo. Another sign that this guy has no idea uh, what he's doing. Not training in any way. He doesn't have good premium ammunition with him. Mounting to 90 live rounds. <laughs> 90 live rounds. Like, like, like that's a lot. Like that, that's, that's nothing. <laughs> All right, not much else to say on this video. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.